intervention with timed eating. So time-restricted eating um, is, is kind of a key. So the very first thing that I would say for you guys is set a goal. Now, you've already set your goal. Do you, have you been following time-restricted eating? Yeah, I think it was pretty much before, though, just by the nature of do it. But yeah. sometimes my work schedule gets complicated. So. It's hard, isn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, now if you're looking to uh, lose weight, um, to trim up at all, then two days a week is where you want to compress that, that time restriction. So I have two days a week um, where I'll do like six to eight hours. So typically, um, excuse me, I'm like a weekend. Um, now I only do it one day a week. But when I lost the liver in like three weeks, all I did is I changed, um, I changed when I was eating to six hours, and I did that on, oh, that doesn't work, does it? I did that just on a Sunday, so, um, so I think that could be something um, you guys look into doing, and, and I don't mean uh, restrict your calories, but maybe one day a week where you go down to about six to 800 calories, and it's phenomenal for fat burning. Because I got, my, my sons gave me this uh, challenge to get my six pack back before I turned 40. And uh, I've got um, about seven weeks. <laughs> and so it's getting there. I got four of the six. I just have this one <laughs> little area. <laughs> so it's coming along. All right, but one of the things I've been following very closely is making sure that I've got good, healthy bacteria. So one of the ways you can instigate this um, healthy biome is get something fermented in your body, ideally in the morning before you eat. Um, do you guys like sauerkraut mm -hmm. or kimchi? So no, more than that, kimchi. It's not oh. a taste, but it's delicious if you like it. <laughs> yeah, don't, the first time I tried, oh, that's nasty. Don't just give up on it, keep trying. You're right, because uh, the first time I saw it, I was like, this smells like something died, and because it's oh, fermented cat. <laughs> Yeah, but if you like sauerkraut, then you know, this is just the Korean version of sauerkraut because it's not hard. It's not hard. Yeah, artichoke parts are great, but they're, they're just not mm -hmm. fermented. Pickles are fermented, yes. So before you eat, after you've gone through your fast, let's say you just went 14 hours, you haven't eaten anything, there's a couple things that are going to happen that you guys will want to be aware of. The first thing is you're going to get really hungry. And you'll find that if you're, if you're exercising properly, you want to make sure that you're exercising in this 14-hour period of fasting and try not to eat about one to two hours after you exercise. A lot of people will tell you, you need protein before you exercise. It's just not true. Nothing's ever been proven on that. Or they'll say, you need to get a bunch of protein in after you exercise. Or you see like kind of the, the uh, people at the gym, they got their protein shakes and they're, they're just pounding the protein. And then if you look at, at them, they also got the big belly because their liver can't handle all that protein. So um, one of the best things you can do to get the best benefits from your workouts is not eat until about, I try and go two hours after a workout, at least go an hour after a workout. And you'll find that this puts your body into this mode called autophagy. Now, autophagy is when your body's clean up the cellular mass. So what autophagy means is auto means self, and um, phagy means to eat. So you basically, it's when your cells eat off the areas, the mitochondria that aren't working anymore, the cell eats itself. Or the cell destroys another cell that just needs to be removed altogether. So when you trigger autophagy, what you're doing is creating new life and new growth into your body. And the mitochondria in your cell are directly correlated to the bacteria in your gut. So, so a lot can happen there. All right, so here's a study where we talk about um, the gut microbes. So this is in Cell Press um, last December, or December of 2016, two years ago. Gut micro, gut micro movements regulate host circadian rhythms. So one of the things that we found that regulates our circadian rhythms are these gut microbes. So which ones are they? I mean, the, the two biggest are the Bacteriotes and Firmicute. Now, these are some of the uh, most studied and referenced um, species, but there's, there's over 1,200 species that exist in our gut. So, 
So what we find is they, they regulate all these things, everything we're doing throughout the course of a day. So let's look at what happens um, to our bodies. So we wake up, six, six in the morning, you're gonna have a rise of blood pressure. This is also when you're going to have cortisol levels are gonna be on the rise. By the time we get to, uh, you know, right around seven o'clock, 7.30, that's when melatonin shuts, shuts down. So has anyone ever taken melatonin? What, what did you take it for? They'd go to sleep, right? Mm -hmm. By the time we get to 8.30, that's a great time to have a bowel movement, you know, sometime in the morning. Um, highest testosterone secretions, 9 o'clock. Highest alertness, 10 o'clock. So where are we right now? It's like 9.35. So, so you all are going to have higher testosterone. Um, you're going to have, um, you know, uh, high alertness. Uh, if you need to pause and have a bowel moment, go ahead. No problem. Right? <laughs> go ahead. You have higher testosterone levels happen at about say nine thirty. Does that explain why men like to have sex in the morning versus at night? Yeah, that, that can be one of the things. <laughs> Gary, tell us about that. No, 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 no. <laughs> yes, that is. I don't know. Plus at our age, we don't care. <laughs> you guys have time. I mean, um, yeah, most of us, you know, we're we're having sex too late in the in the evening when it's like things are down regulating. But no, it's a great time. And the thing about it with women too is uh, testosterone is uh, libido hormone. So. Yeah, very good time to make love. Um, by 12 noon, this is when we're still on high alerts. Your best coordination comes around 2.30. So if you're doing a balance test or if you've got like a, a yoga class, 2.30 is a good time to jump into a yoga class. Um, is something not working? Did you want this to be live? To we're, be we're live. We're, oh, yeah. we're all on here. Okay, Sorry. I just knew it was making sure I wasn't. Cade, <laughs> um, let me know if there's any questions on your end. All right, I'm. I'll fill them. Okay, great. So, um, fastest reaction time is right around three thirty. So, um, if I'm ever thinking about doing something extreme, like with Cade, my brother on the webinar here, he's a, a crazy mountain biker. So, usually, I'll put it off until the afternoon so I don't die trying to fall in the ground. Um, that's where your fastest reaction time is. <laughs> um, greatest cardiovascular efficiency and muscle strength, five o'clock. So what would be some good things to do right around five o'clock? Yeah, work it out. Um, get, get some, uh, you know, if you're running like a, a race, that's a great time to do it. Highest blood pressure is at 6.30. So a lot of times people are in the grocery store and they see those blood pressure cops and I'm like, I'm going to check my blood pressure. And it's like 6.30 at night. And then they come see me the next day and like, I think I'm going to have a stroke. My blood pressure is so high. And I'm like, well, let's test it in the morning um, or sometime in midday. And, it, and that gives us a better idea. Highest body temperature is right around 7 o'clock at night. And then uh, it starts to get dark outside. And this is when your melatonin secretion starts to begin. Your bowel movements are suppressed right around at 1030 at night until the next morning. So then your body can actually sleep. And, and so this is a process that uh, we go through every single day. Our deepest sleep occurs two hours into our sleep. Uh, lowest body temperature is around 430 in the morning. And then we wake up the next day and do it again. But it's really important if you want to set up your body's health to respect the circadian rhythms because what we find is what happens most of the time at night? What do we have exposure to? Is it actually dark where we're at? Yeah. Right? Some of us, we do dim the lights and that's really important, but most people are in front of a screen or you've got all this light exposure. So make sure at night to um, you know, start nestling down, get ready for bed, have a process. Um, we say no blue screens about an hour before bed. 
Um, so that means like looking at your phone. Most people are in their bed. They're watching. They're looking at Facebook or they got a big TV there. So, so twenty four seven. All right. So at least an hour, just turn it off before you go to bed, and it it, it makes a world of difference. It's huge, very phenomenal. Um, Do you have a friend out of that last chart? Shows, no, we can get it for you. No problem. I'd be interested in how to talk to you. Yeah. Nice to remember, right? Well, it's something you can use to kind of regulate what we're doing. Yeah. I've yep. got a 2.30, 3.30, 5.00 p.m., 6.30, 7.00 p.m. Yeah. 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 There you go. Great. Um, but yeah, we can get you a link to that, Gary. So here's, here's some things you want to look at. Um, what we found is that our nutrition, um, one of the best things you can do is if you can connect it to the microbiota imbalances that you may have. Um, but if you look at it, different bacteria are active during a different part of the day. So, so it, I already mentioned this earlier, but if you're eating it all the time, that you're going to be uh, causing this growth of bacteria that you know you may not want to be growing, um, especially if you're eating at night. And when do we have access to food these days? 24-7. 24-7. So. <laughs> <laughs> you can find food at any time. Now, did our ancestors have that? No. You know, my, my wife's grandmother just turned 100, and I was just, I went to her 100th birthday, and I was, I just asked her, I was like, what's the most incredible thing you've seen over the last hundred years? And I thought she would, you know, say like, oh, electricity or something like that. She's like, the internet. She's like, but I don't trust it. They're all watching you. And so, you know, it's kind of funny. But then I said, what was it like before you had electricity? She's like, we just had lamps. It was no big deal. But I said, what changed in the food? She said, well, we used to go and we'd have to get our food. We'd trade with other farmers and they would just work to and grow their own food. She's like, now they come in a package. I don't know what it is. I don't trust it, you know? And so, so much has changed, but the biggest thing that's, that's changed is our ability to access the food. And so I think this is where a lot of chronic disease is coming from. And so what we found is regularity between fasting and eating allows a vast variety of species to grow. These are some of the, the research that I've done on this. So if you want to get a, a, a variety of species, there's this one bacteria that many of you, you may have heard of, is called acromantia. And acromantia is uh, a bug in your gut, very healthy. Um, it will stave off obesity, heart disease, cancer, diabetes, uh, but it's called acromantia. And the acromantia feeds on the mucosal lining of your gut. And so the only way it can ever feed on the mucosal lining of your gut is if you fast. And so how is our diet set up these days? You know, when I went to school, you had, I mean, we always ate breakfast, right? I mean, breakfast is the most important meal of the day. And most of the time what I was eating was milk and cereal, right? Because <laughs> it's fast. And my mom, we have five kids, so... It was, uh, you know, it's like, let's get what we can. But that was what the, the food industry trained us to eat a lot of whole grain, uh, whole grains, right? Complex carbohydrates. Yeah. And so you never went through that stage. No, I'm too old. 70 plus years ago, we had to have an egg, a piece of bacon, yep. a piece of toast, a glass of milk, uh -huh. or orange juice or something. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And then we moved away where it's like, all right, let's do whole grains. And then, you know, we went fat free. So that egg that you're eating is going to spike your cholesterol, which has never been proven. It's actually been disproven. That bacon's going to be toxic for you. So, yeah, we look at that now. We're like, actually, bacon's got some pretty good uh, healing properties, especially if you get the nitrate free. There's some good fats in there. Yeah, but eat it at night. But um, that's, that's what we look at. And so... Um, so we went through this whole science experiment and we found that everyone ate breakfast and then we had a snack, a midday snack, and then we ate lunch and then we had a snack and then we ate dinner and then we had dessert. So how many times is that that we're eating? Six. Six times, right? So what I'm saying is 
maybe two or three times a day is maximum when you eat. All the snacking in between is unnecessary and it doesn't allow these bacterial species to grow. And for some of you who are, um, you know, you're eating food all the time and your doctor's told you, oh, you're hypoglycemic, you need to eat more frequently, um, it's just not true. One of the quickest ways of reversing your hypoglycemia is to actually give yourself some space in between eating because then your cells truly will take in that energy as a, as a food source. Okay, with my diabetes, I've been told to eat three times a day mm -hmm. and to have them about the same time mm -hmm. each day. I haven't done that. Mm -hmm. There's my problem. Yeah. I eat twice a day as a rule. Okay. And I eat when I'm hungry. I have, Gary always brings me a hard boiled egg and some toast in the morning. Yeah. And my drink mm -hmm. with the uh, oh, so with collagen in it. Yeah. And then we have a kind of a late supper, and there's our problem. Okay. Yeah, and maybe that would be just the one tweak. And what I would recommend for everybody is try eating at a different time. And you know, maybe it's try and you do maybe two days a week, you just do two meals, and you restrict your calories a little, and then five days a week, you try and do three good solid meals. I know. No, no fun, but I'm glad it's much better for you than eating all day long. So you want to eat and then get hungry and then eat and then get hungry. Like we don't, what we do is we're eating all day long constantly and we're never letting ourselves get hungry. But when you get hungry, those hunger pains that you feel, those hunger pains are actually the way that our body is healing our digestive system. So we need to experience some hunger. And this is where I advocate like going on a fast, you know, once a month fast for a full day or every three months do like a four or five day fast. It's really good for your, your body and it's good for your acromancy. So, so we found that time restricted eating changes the way sugars are digested. So some of the research will show that you will not have this spike in insulin if you're doing time restricted eating. So a lot of us, um, our pancreases are so fatigued. And just to give you guys just a little reminder of what happens is when we eat food, we eat sugars, something like that, what our body does is we eat these sugars and then our pancreas secretes insulin. And there's one way of testing if your pancreas is secreting enough insulin, and that's through what's it's called a C-peptide test. So as your pancreas makes insulin, it also makes what's called C-peptides, and then these C-peptides get pushed in your blood and you can test your blood for C-peptides and see, see how your pancreas is actually doing. Because some of you, if you've got blood sugar issues, you're actually not making enough insulin and not producing it. And that's where we'd see a C-peptide and that's what happens in long-term diabetes. Or the other thing that's more, more common is what's called insulin resistance. Now what happens in insulin resistance is you have sugar in your blood, your pancreas secretes insulin, the insulin takes the sugar and transports it to the cell, but then the cell gets the insulin there and the cell says, no, nope, you can't come in. And so there's these transporters called the GLUT4 transporters that come to the surface of the cell and they grab the sugar and bring it into the cell's mitochondria and use it for energy. If those transporters get fatigued from taking in too much sugar because you're eating all the time, then the the transporters say, no, I can't do it. I can't take another load for you. I'm, I'm too tired. And then that sugar, it gets pushed back into the blood, which creates massive inflammation, and then eventually gets stored as fat. So one of the things we found with time-restricted eating is it changes the way sugars are digested because those transporters, those guys that get tired in your cells, they're very robust. They're like, yes, we'll take it. And so they're, they're very energized and ready to work. So... The final thing is it can decrease our cholesterol level and increase the production of bile acid. So what does bile acid do for us? It breaks everything down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so specifically bile is uh, what emulsifies fats. So if you're eating a lot of fat, the the thing, the mistake I see people make when they go like, I want to do a ketosis diet. You know, it's great. I'm, I'm glad you're diving into eating more fats. But if you don't have a healthy gallbladder and enough bile to actually emulsify and break down these fats, 
then it's going to come up into your throat and it's, it's going to create some very um, uncomfortable digestion. You'll have bloating specifically is one of the symptoms of poor bile secretion. Bile, and interestingly enough, when your gallbladder secretes bile, bile is what your pancreas uses to make insulin. So, you know, bile itself helps regulate the insulin sensitivity in your body. But what we found is that if you have enough bile, then that fat can be digested and then it can be used by the cells in your body so that your liver doesn't have to produce cholesterol. Because a lot of us think cholesterol comes from the foods we eat, which is not true. That's a myth. Most of the cholesterol in your body, when it's tested, it comes from your liver. Maybe 15% of the cholesterol um, comes from food and has an influence over our cholesterol levels. It's actually your liver. So a lot of times, if you don't have enough bile, then your body's not metabolizing the fats, and then it gets recirculated to your liver, and your liver gets fatigued and pushes more cholesterol into your blood. Which cholesterol does it generate most of the HDL and LDL. Yeah. Are they in balance or? Yeah, I mean, that, um, if you've got a healthy bile, so you're asking which one of those molecules. Your, it's your liver, Jim. Both of those. It's, it, it, it's equal. Your, li your liver is what's distributing all of those. So how do we do that? Well, when, you've got, when you have your cholesterol test, mm -hmm. somebody will say, we've got too much of this. And you see a little of that, yeah. So that's, uh, it's all on an individual basis. For those of you who didn't hear, Gary just asked, um, yeah, how do we? How do you know? You know, if your LDL and HDL shows up, you know, if you have a, a positive signing sign, like a positive test, meaning it's elevated, then um, but just a couple general things you look at. First of all, we got to get your liver healthy, so that means liver detoxification. Second of all, you got to get your gallbladder healthy, so your gallbladder can actually produce enough bile to break down those fats. And the third thing is sugar. So. Cholesterol is more influenced by sugar and, and more elevated by sugar than anything else. So there's these things called uh, age, so advanced glycation end products, and that's what destroys the arterial lining. And then cholesterol goes in there to try to repair the arteries and ends up creating a mess. So, so just avoid the sugar. But, and then we, it's always case by case beyond that. So here's what we know. Scientists discovered that it's not only what we eat, but when we eat because of the microbial circadian rhythm. So what these rhythms do, as you can see here, is um, at night you have a different uh, number of species that are active. So you can see this is the species that are active at night when you're sleeping. As the day comes up, certain species migrate down, and you can see on this, on this image the lining of the intestinal wall is all being you know, there's a lot of different um, activity going on there. Things are being healed in the intestinal lining. So if you've got leaky gut, one of the best ways to heal it is through this time restricted eating. And then as the sun comes up, certain microbes, they, they go to sleep, and then other microbes come alive. But the ones that are the most active at night are these mucosal-associated bacteria. This is one more fasting. And then as, as the day goes on, there's certain species that will get circulated, circulated in the blood in the nighttime. And a lot of these things at night are going to be um, the nutrients that your body needs to actually repair itself. Because when we're sleeping, our bodies are in this beautiful repair mode. And then at night, um, we're also doing massive detoxification. So, so what we're finding is that uh, personalized food can stabilize blood sugar based on the microbial circadian rhythm. So that means we've got to find the foods that work best for you. So what they've done is they've done studies with mice, and they, they actually monitor these mice, the, the circadian rhythm. And what they found in these, in these normal mice who had access to food at, at uh, uh, you know, certain times of the day, they measured their gut population, the bacteria population, and what they found is that these lean mice, you know, they, they became normal as long as they you know, were restricted on what they were eating, the, the types and qualities of the nutrients. So then they're testing, they're saying, okay, if a mice eats healthy, quality nutrients, is it going to stay lean mice? Yes. So this is basically the control group. Then they took lean mice and they said, okay, 
24 hours a day, they can have access to fatty, greasy foods, whatever they want. Now, what's going to happen? So what they found is there's this uniform obesity associated gut bacteria population that started to grow, and these mice became obese. And then they did the same thing. They took lean mice and they said, okay, we're gonna put them on a time-restricted diet. You can only have access to these, this, this same food that, the mice, that made the other mice obese. You can only have access to that for an eight hour window. And then what they found is these mice, they presumed that the obesogenic bacteria were reduced and these mice became lean. Other interesting study that they've done is they've taken obese mice and skinny mice and basically they've done, you guys know fecal matter transplants. So they took the, the poop from the, the obese mice, put it in skinny mice, skinny mice became obese and the obese mice became lean eating the same diets they were before just by transporting the, the stool. So food can affect it, but the, when you eat food is just as important because as you can see in these lean mice, it, when just by having time restriction means you can have a little more leeway in what you're eating. So I need food from a skinny person. <laughs> you, you know? I have to lose this. They're doing it now. Yeah. There's some stuff on yeah. it. Yeah. Good thing. <laughs> it is. It's an exciting new area of medicine. And, um, you know, for a while there, there are clinics that were actually doing a lot of fecal matter transplant. We were looking into it about three years ago, of uh, getting it here. I know it sounds weird because, you know, you, you've got a blender that you're running fecal matter through. <laughs> um, yeah. We're going to do a demonstration next week. Uh, no, I'm no. <laughs> but I won't make them. <laughs> yeah, the uh, the medical board started shutting down the clinics that were doing it because uh, now there's a pharmaceutical company that's got poop in a pill, and so they're genetically matching, um, you know, the bacteria that can go the best with your own bacteria, which is a, a safer way of doing it because people are doing fecal matter transplants. And they didn't realize that, yeah, like there's this one mother who got the fecal matter from her 18-year-old daughter, and the mother had colitis, like severe colitis, and it completely healed her colitis, but then the mother became obese, because the daughter was obese too, so, you know, now they can screen it out and you can get a little better, but, so, yeah, very interesting. Hey, uh, we, we had a question over here, uh, Reagan, oh, um, and I, I was a little slow. Uh, getting it relayed to you is when you were talking about okay. uh, foods sure. and the best thing to eat for breakfast. Um, what's what's the ideal thing to eat for yep. breakfast, and then the best hours of time restricted. Um, and I mean, I think you kind of went over that in in uh, generalities and um, is daily good. Oh yeah. No, the, those are the nuts and bolts of this whole thing. I mean, I can give you guys all the science, but you probably it's just interesting. But yeah, the, the, the tactical things is time restriction, no more than a 12 hour eating window. And that's like the starting level. But ideally, you want to restrict it to about 10, eight to 10 hours a day when you're eating. It depends on what your goals are. Um, if your goals are I want to lose weight, then you want to be down to like eight hours a day is when you want to be eating. So maybe that's two meals a day, maybe it's three meals, but all you're doing is eating from noon until eight at night, for example, or 11 until seven. Um, and then that means, and when I say time restriction, that doesn't mean like, like, oh, I'm having something that has no calories in it, because even if it has no calories, it's still going to trigger a metabolic process. So um, hopefully that answers. Yeah. Okay. Oh, go ahead. Um, what What about uh, like mineral water, sparkling water, those type of things? Can they trigger a, a metabolic response? No, you should you should be fine with those as long as it's not like a flavored. Um, and this is getting pretty like nitpicky on my part, but even taking your vitamins. It wakes up your liver, it wakes up bacteria in your gut because it has to be uh, assimilated. Um, same if you've got like a flavor in there, it triggers certain taste buds which start secretions. Um, okay. The best and way. And tea, tea was a question, and I know that's, yeah. that does start the metabolic process. So that's it. a no. So, best thing you can do, you can do salt in water. And I'm telling you, that will save you as you're starting to do this or as you're going on your longer fasts. 
is uh, salt and water can be huge um, to uh, stave off the hunger and you really want to stay hydrated on this on this diet. I mean, you got to be drinking a lot of water. So I'm always packing around my big old jug, making sure I'm getting plenty of water in. Um, but yeah, that, those are great questions there. Ideal thing to eat for breakfast in the morning. It really depends on the individual. But what I recommend is no protein in the morning besides maybe from some eggs. Eggs, eggs are fine. They've got a lot of fat and they've got some protein too. Uh, make sure you're eating the yolks there and then lots of vegetables and ideally some type of like sauerkraut or something fermented is what you want to do after you fasted because breakfast you know break fast um, is you know the eating something that's fermented gets your your body ready and prepared to consume food and get energy from that food so um, so I like to eat like uh, arugula with uh, maybe cooked spinach um, with uh, an egg or two in the morning and then I'll put a couple tablespoons of olive oil on it. I always put radishes in there, maybe some kale. Um, the radishes, you want to eat radishes with your cruciferous vegetables and then I'll put some sauerkraut on there um, and it's, it's, a, it's a great breakfast. I'll have maybe some bulletproof coffee, bulletproof tea um, to, to get some healthy fats, but I like to start out my day with about 50 grams of fat. Um, ideally, I have an avocado, and then uh, basically the same thing for lunch, and then at dinner is when I'll eat the proteins, some more animal proteins. Dinner, um, I'll eat carbohydrates, um, and uh, you know, I'll eat a lot at dinner and a lot of carbohydrates, it's, uh, around uh, 80 to 100 grams of carbohydrates at night. Sleep amazing. I sleep much better when I do carbohydrates at night versus when I don't. So um, that's kind of my, my, that's a general summary. So great questions, everyone. Anything else, Cade, that, that uh, you've got? No, that was great. I, I was interested. Uh, why did you say eat uh, radishes with your cruciferous vegetables? Um, so there is a, a compound in radishes that uh, actually neutralizes some of the goitrogenic properties in uh, the cruciferous. So really, that you can eat raw cruciferous and not destroy your thyroid, That's which awesome. I still recommend cooking it. But I eat radishes just, uh, I mean, I like them. Uh, they've got a lot of sulfur and phosphorus in them. Um, great for your kidneys. So. Awesome. Thank you. You got it. Well, appreciate you guys being on the, the webinar today. And thanks you guys for coming. Yeah, it's nice having live bodies here. All right, we'll see you next hey, week. Thanks. Have a great one, everybody.